I'm Sarah Peters, and I direct public programs here at The Walker. And I'm Sarah Schultz, and I'm the Director of Education and Community Programs here at The Walker. And we want to welcome you to all to tonight's program, Opening the Field, um, an event which marks and celebrates the beginning of a summer-long invitation to all of you to invent something with us together. If you read The Walker blogs at all, you may already know that Open Field is a project that has um, spent well over a year in incubation, and even despite that year, due to the rainy weather is still not quite done, but will be complete by early next week. Close. <laughs> um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge Angus and Margaret Wordle for their early support and optimism for the project, without which we would not be here today. And of course, the continued generosity of Target, both for their commitment to supporting Target Free Thursday nights, as well as the Open Field Project. So what exactly is Open Field? Open Field is an experiment in imagining a new kind of public space, an attempt to create a place that is vibrant, interactive, fun, and intentionally fosters a spirit of open intellectual, social, and creative exchange among its users. In light of all the cultural changes we've been experiencing, we felt a really renewed imperative to think about what it means to create public spaces and to participate in public life. The commons, the notion that certain resources are publicly owned and managed for the good of the whole seemed like an apt metaphor to begin this investigation. We see the commons as a robust and open-ended framework that can inspire all of us to consider the creative resources we collectively share and produce, what we offer the collective sphere as individuals, and to reflect on the kinds of public and personal ex exchanges and interactions we value and how they shape us. The field of research and writing about the commons is varied and complex. What a cultural commons is, how it functions, what it means for a museum, for makers, for you, the public, remain lively arenas of debate. And we certainly have many more questions than we do answers. So for tonight, we've pulled together a program that we consider the start of an ongoing conversation. And in the midst of this project early on, we came quickly to the realization that as museum programmers, we couldn't and shouldn't try to make um, a cultural commons by ourselves. So we intentionally crafted a project that functions as an open platform that would allow us to work with artists, colleagues, and you, our audience. So over the summer, over the course of Open Field, you will find workshops, lectures, and other programs organized by Walker staff. Um, events curated by partners, residency projects with artists, and activities brought to the field by you, the public. So far, we have 30 publicly generated programs on the open field calendar that range from a ballet rehearsal to a series of conversations and discussions about the role of a public intellectual. And we've just started, so we look forward at what is to come. From the beginning of this project, it's been an effort, um, it, it's been a real exchange between many people outside and, and both outside and inside the walker. Internally, it's been a really uh, a collective effort, um, and to name any one person in that effort would, would be to shortchange the contributions of all. So I extend a huge thank you um, to, on behalf for all of our colleagues in the process. And from outside these walls, numerous people have brainstormed with us and provided guidance over the past year. And I'm happy to introduce tonight two individuals who have been key partners in the development of not only tonight's program, but of Open Field as a whole. Colin Klecker and Shanai Matson work in a collective under the name Works Progress, coming from the backgrounds of architecture and design and science, cultural studies, and museum work respectively. They work with other creative people to conduct research, design exhibitions, make events, and stir up ideas to get people thinking and talking. And we're gonna welcome them to the stage to explain the format of the evening and to introduce the rest of tonight's guests. So please welcome Colin and Chennai. Thank you, Sarah and Sarah, for inviting us to uh, be part of this event and to help imagine it. Um, Colin will interrupt me if I start talking and don't stop talking, <laughs> which sometimes happens. So, um, we were asked by these by Sarah and Sarah to help um, select speakers for tonight's event, and so we came up with um, a long list and we narrowed it down in order to have um, a series of speakers that are interdisciplinary and that are approaching this idea of open field and the cultural commons from various perspectives. And so we're really excited to have them presenting. Um, they'll give short 10-minute presentations. Um, we'll break it up in the middle 
middle with a little activity that we hope will get you guys talking to one another. And then at the end, we have a Q&A that is a little bit different maybe than the Q&A that you would expect at something like this. Um, is there anything else you want to say about the program? Yeah, we've also got a couple activities. Um, you might have noticed the big uh, map of the commons uh, made out of felt. Um, that's something that we really hope you guys will uh, get involved with and add to, edit. Um, we're really looking for um, kind of your ideas for what kinds of things might happen uh, out in the open field. Um, also, maybe I see some of them out there, you guys are wearing these name tags. Um, and uh, we hope that you, you'll use these as kind of an excuse to get out and just kind of talk to each other and uh, meet each other. Um. And those, those name tags, as well as the idea that inspired um, the game that we'll play in the middle, come from an event that um, a number of Works Progress folks uh, produce called Give and Take. And I see a number of you, how many of you have been to Give and Take? I'm just curious. Yeah, so you guys will know how this works. And then our host is here also. Um, so thanks. Um, so let's just get on with introducing uh, tonight's speakers. Um, as I said, there'll be five of them, and they each come from, uh, they, they all have a really interesting background, and you can read a really full description of them in the program. We're going to do just the really quick description because it's going to be a full evening. Um, we'll start out tonight with Michael Edson, who is the Director of Web and New Media Strategy at the Smithsonian Institution, um, and he's going to be talking about museums and digital commons. Laura Masakio is an Associate Professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Landscape Architecture, and she's going to be talking about the role that space plays in commons, so making, making space for commons. Um, Sumanth Gopinath is going to be talking about mobile music and the ringtone industry. He's an assistant professor of music theory at the University of Minnesota School of Music. Uh, Caroline Willard uh, is an artist and co-founder of Our Goods. She'll be talking about exchange in the commons. Uh, John Ippolito is an artist, curator, and co-founder of the Stillwater Program for Network, Art, and Culture at the University of Maine. He'll be talking about tools for a healthy commons. And then, like I said, afterwards, we'll have a Q&A, and then we're going to all have a chance to go out into the museum and meet one another on a more face-to-face -face basis and share a drink um, and dance. So stick around for that. I think we'll get started. Michael, are you ready? I'm ready. Um, thank you all for coming. Let's welcome Michael. I'm Michael Edson. I'm the director of Web and New Media Strategy at the Smithsonian Institution. And I'm leading a project, a new project called the Smithsonian Commons, which is probably why I'm here today. Uh, my job this evening as the first speaker is to establish some givens or make some assertions about what a digital commons might be. Uh, think of me as DJ Mikey Mike. I'm going to lay down a rhythm track for the deaf jam to follow. That sounded as terrible coming out of my <laughs> mouth as I thought it would. Um, and I'm going to open up a, a torrent of ideas on you right now. And uh, don't worry if you can't keep up. There's a hyperlink in the catalog, in the, in the program for today. Uh, I'm also online. All these slides, talks, footnotes, the whole bit. And more information about commons is starting at slideshare.net forward slash Edson M. So, I grew up in this place, Washington, D.C. I was into art and science, and the Smithsonian was pretty much the coolest thing in town. I could take a bus downtown and just walk in and out of free museums all day long, letting my uh, curiosity take me any place it wanted to go. In some ways, you could say that I came of age at the Smithsonian, that as I became an independent young adult, the world's largest museum and research complex, the Smithsonian Institution, modeled my understanding of what it was to be an adult and explore the world. It's good to learn, to research and inquire, to ask questions, to draw people into conversation, to provoke and sometimes disrupt when necessary, to create, in short, to engage as an active participant in the world of ideas. I grew up in a city, in a country, that valued these things and that chose to express those values by building and maintaining with the best tools it had available to it in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, a complex of buildings and staff and collections and experts and bureaucrats for manufacturing knowledge and spreading learning to a grateful and attentive public. And, and it was good. It made me the citizen I am today in many ways, but 
All of this happened 30 years ago, before the World Wide Web. The Smithsonian has a new five-year strategic plan that articulates four grand challenges. Unlocking the mysteries of the universe. Thank you for laughing at that. <laughs> Understanding and sustaining a biodiverse planet. Valuing world cultures and understanding the American experience. That's not a very bad uh, checklist for five years of work. Um, and I love this strategy. I love this strategy because it talks about doing difficult, audacious, important work in society. Work that maybe no other institution can do. Work that matters. But from where we stand now, 2010, deep in the heart of this wonderful, rich, disruptive digital age, the crazy new logic of technology raises certain first order questions about how we're going to work on these grand challenges. Where is the work going to take place? What kinds of organization, platforms, infrastructure will be needed to do this work? Uh, what is the organizational change model? How do we get from being a 19th and 20th century organization to being a 21st century organization? Who will be the innovators? Who will be the connectors? Who will be the drivers of change? And ultimately, who will be the beneficiaries? The tools of the last century are going to be important to us moving forward. But with every plot twist in this story, every romance, love scene, and mystery, I find myself returning to the idea of a commons. So what is a commons? What is a digital commons? Uh, abstractly, you could say that a commons is a set of resources maintained in the public sphere for the use and benefit of everyone. Typically, a commons gets created when a property owner decides that a given set of resources grass for grazing sheep, forest for parkland, software, patents. A given set of resources will be more valuable if freely shared than if restricted. In the law and in the way we understand the world works, we recognize that no idea stands alone and that all ideas are built on the knowledge and innovation and ideas of others. When creators, educators, scientists, entrepreneurs, business people, when everyone has access to the raw materials of knowledge, innovation flourishes. Conversely, unnecessarily restricted content is a barrier to innovation. This is the anti-commons, a thicket of difficulties. If you can't find an idea, if you can't ascertain its context, if you can't use your social network, however you define that, to expand on the idea or find out more about it, if you can't get legal permission to take that idea and build it into a new idea, then knowledge and innovation suffer. Unnecessarily restricted content is like a virus that spreads through the internet making the intellectual property provenance of each generation of new ideas, the scaffolding of our culture, less and less clear, less and less strong with every generation. I like to think of a commons as a kind of workshop where the raw materials of knowledge can be found and assembled into new things. Or if you need to build a commons, which I do, uh, you might think of a commons as a kind of gumbo made up of 12 spicy ingredients. Uh, so think of the next few minutes as a cooking show with me as your perky, reliable host explaining what you could get from a mix of these 12 different ingredients. Um, federated, a commons brings things together that would ordinarily be separate. The Smithsonian Collection Search Center brings together over 4.2 million records from 23 separate Smithsonian databases. A commons is designed for you, not me, you. Software developer and social media thought leader Kathy Sierra says that every user is a hero in their own epic journey. The job of the Smithsonian Commons isn't for us to brag about the great work we do, it's to help you succeed in your lifelong learning journeys. Findable. It doesn't do much good to have a bunch of stuff in a Commons if you can't find it. Uh, the crowdsourced stock photo site, iStockPhoto, makes it a joy to find things. It's better findability than any museum, library, or archive site I know. The tool vendor McMaster Carr is a close second, and there are links to all of these in this paper up online. 
shareable. The whole purpose of putting resources into a commons is so that they can sh be spread, so they can share. If it doesn't share, it isn't there. Uh, a commons is shareable by default. On the Brooklyn Museum's website, sharing is built right into the platform. Intellectual property policies in a commons are uniform and clearly stated. So users know in advance, without having to call your museum's rights and reproductions department, what they can and can't do with the content there. On Flickr, the copyright and permissions for every photograph are stated clearly on every page. Free, free resources are crucial to innovation and creativity, says Creative Commons founder Lawrence Lessig. Free, findable, and shareable form a particularly powerful combination. The Internet Archive website says on their homepage that, like a paper library, we provide free access. Sometimes people need a lot of something, or all of something, to solve a problem. On the Powerhouse Museum's website, you can download their entire collection database with one click. And sometimes you need to be able to write a program to work with data, particularly when you've got a lot of it. Uh, the information in the commons needs to be uh, understandable to computer programs, machine readable. Data.gov is designed to encourage digital mashups across the federal government through machine readable formats. A commons should make available. I'm going to slow that one down because this is a biggie. Ingredient number nine. A commons should make available for free the highest quality, highest resolution resource possible. On NASA's website, you can download photographs so big that you can see how individual grains of Martian soil were compacted and parted by the Mars rovers. The paltry images on most museum websites thwart the efforts of researchers and art lovers and enthusiasts and undermine our attempts to let the drama and importance of our collections shine through. Ingredient 10. Because resources are free and high quality and sharing and reuse are encouraged, new kinds of collaborative work can take place. New kinds of collaborative work are taking place right under our noses without needing to involve lawyers or contracts or bureaucrats. This is fast, agile work. Clay Shirky says, uh, author Clay Shirky, and here comes everybody, says, we're living in the middle of a remarkable increase in our ability to share, to cooperate with one another, and to take collective action all outside the framework of traditional institutions and organizations like mine. Getting the free and ready participation of a large distributed group with a variety of skills has gone from impossible to simple. Ingredient 10, collaboration without control, is exemplified by MIT OpenCourseWare. Some wonderful case studies on that website. 11, network effects. In a commons designed with network effects in mind, you get a virtuous cycle. The more the resources are used, the better they become. The better the resources become, the more people use them. It's like a self-scooping ice cream cone. Over 180,000 people have added map data for free to the OpenStreetMap project. And those contributions have created an incredibly powerful resource that can be reused, used by anyone for free. OpenStreetMaps. The public domain, ingredient 12. The public domain is important. James Boyle writes that the public domain is not some gummy residue left behind when all the good stuff has been covered by property law. The public domain is the place where we quarry the building blocks of our culture. Now, after stirring this gumbo around for a couple months, tasting it, I think it needs a 13th ingredient. And I think that 13th ingredient is trust. Uh, Wired Magazine founding editor Kevin Kelly said, the network economy is founded on technology, but can only be built on relationships. It was also founded on beer, by the way. <laughs> The network economy is founded on technology, but can only be built on relationships. It starts with chips, and it ends with trust. The Smithsonian is in the forever business. By putting something in the Smithsonian Commons, if it's a cultural treasure, a fossil of a bug, a folk song, or a community, 
We're asking people to trust us. We're not going to scam you. We're not going to take advantage of your personal information. We're not going to violate your privacy. We're going to be honest about what we do and don't know. We're going to be open to new ideas. We're going to be open to new points of view. We're going to help each other figure out the world. And these promises are good forever. There really aren't many other organizations, kinds of groups in the world other than museums and archives and libraries who can make these kinds of forever promises. And we take that responsibility very seriously. We're just getting started understanding what this Smithsonian Commons is going to look like. And to help people understand it in a, in a visceral way, um, we decided to build a series of prototypes, four prototypes that show what this finished Smithsonian Commons might look like uh, as seen through the eyes of our users, the people we care about. The four stories are seen through the eyes of a, a visitor, a fourth grade teacher, a millennial, a, di a digital native who's mostly seeing our content out in the web, out in the wild, and the last story is about a citizen scientist. Let me play you this short story so you can see what the finished Smithsonian Commons might look like as seen through the eyes of this astronomer, amateur astronomer. Vast, findable, shareable, free, the Smithsonian Commons. A third of Smithsonian web visitors identify themselves as enthusiasts, lovers of art, nature, science, and history. This story shows how the Smithsonian Commons helps enthusiasts and citizen researchers to find and engage with Smithsonian resources. I work as an electrician by day, but I'm an amateur astronomer by night. I keep track of a lot of astronomy resources on the internet, and I have a blog where I keep in touch with friends and share what I'm working on. Every year I give a talk about astronomy at my kid's school, and this year I'm making them a web mashup that links the sky chart to photos and videos that explain celestial features. I've met a lot of great people through astronomy, and I want to contribute something back to the community. These are real people. This amateur astronomer uses his phone to subscribe to a number of astronomy-related RSS feeds. This one is from the Smithsonian Commons. He's notified that there's a new picture in the Commons from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory's Chandra X-ray Telescope. On the Smithsonian Commons, he sees the image in the context of the whole Smithsonian, with links to deeper information. It's real information on our websites related topics. Those are the kind of faceted searches you might see related to astronomy. Recommendations, including related exhibitions. It's a real exhibit. Interviews with staff experts. A real interview. And e-commerce opportunities. Real tchotchkes. Communities. <laughs> real comments. Made up shared items. And opportunities to participate and get involved. You can control a Smithsonian telescope through the web. Who knew? Follow, add to this subject, ask an expert, find an astronomy club near you. There's my telescope. The image and associated images are available in high resolution. It's a dramatic example of high res. And because he can clearly see the sharing rights associated with this picture, he knows that he has permission to modify, adapt, or incorporate this image into new works. We're giving permission right up front. He uses sharing tools to... Don't laugh. Embed the photo in his own blog. If you've never done that before, it's magic. <laughs> but that's how it works. Like many websites, the Smithsonian Commons provides an Application Programming Interface, or API, that lets him automatically link Smithsonian images to the star chart mashup he's making for his children's school. So who knew you could do a mashup from Google Sky? You can. It's a real website we found using Smithsonian stuff, done by amateurs. It's like Google Maps for space aliens. This is our amateur astronomer's homepage on the Smithsonian Commons. He's personalized it to help him keep track of what he likes and what he's done. He's an avid Smithsonian Commons user with a strong reputation in the community. 
and his input broadens the reach and impact of the Smithsonian's primary resources and expertise. The Smithsonian Commons is free to use and join, Yay! but by creating a unique and compelling resource, the Commons encourages repeat visits, which should result in increased donations, purchases, and sponsorship revenue over time. He's sponsoring a number of projects. He's a member. How courteous of us to tell him. By encouraging the use of Smithsonian data beyond the walls of the institution, and by embracing the energy and intelligence of our visitors, the Smithsonian Commons creates a virtuous cycle of interaction and learning. I'll finish by saying if this kind of stuff interests you, this prototype and the other three will, uh, with any luck, be available online Monday sometime. Uh, www.si.edu forward slash commons. If this stuff moves you, if you like it, if you hate it, let us know. Thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Masacchio. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon. As uh, Colin mentioned, I'm w with the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Minnesota. And the kind of comments I look at are uh, different than the other speaker. My actually look at uh, places where people live and dwell. And what I'll be showing you today are some slides that I do quite a bit of photography. And so I'll be reading, I guess you could call it a visual essay. Um, I, I, my role is that I'm an urban landscape ecologist and ecological designer. I have background in both. So for me, the world and art and science are, are deeply unified. They've always have been. And so I use photography a lot to understand the landscape. And so one of the most important things about the open field is that I want to communicate to you is that it is a metaphor, but it's also our frame for understanding the collective. And that could mean thinking, mental constructions, and things like that. The metaphor of the open field has strong cultural saliency in Minnesota. And the open field as a collective commons has uh, visual manifestations throughout our metropolitan region. Um, I do look at metropolitan regions a lot. And the open field helps to visually define our collective mental ideas, attitudes, and perceptions, and values of the, of the uh, commons. What's very important is that the commons and our metropolitan regions are overlaps between public, priv and private spaces and places. And the key words to keep in mind include ideas like common land, park, green, and commonality. And in many ways, there's a lot of things going on here. It's, they're complex spaces with a lot of values and actually take a lot of time to unpack to understand them. And so today I'm going to show you um, some of my photographs trying to reveal some relationships and connections about the open field through um, a visual sequence. And they're from my photographs from Minnesota, Chicago, and Germany. And I'm particularly a keen observer of human nature interactions and landscapes. And my photography visually documents and filters key landscape features that capture my attention um, from my perspective as an urban landscape ecologist and ecological designer. And the spaces that I'll show you today have been, quote, designed by regular people and professional designers. And one of the things I want you to think about um, when we're trying to define these spaces is what is the sh shared set of values that are driving the emergence of the design? Whose values, how are they changing, and how do other types of, of non uh, human species fit into all of this too. Because the places we design are not only for us, but other living creatures. We often don't see them. They may be very vicarious experiences, but they live there. There are also all the plants that live there that we have grown to appreciate or maybe not appreciate as much or as fully. So one of the big themes I want to talk about today is this idea of uh, the commons from rural to urban, but also how we have typically separated them out in terms of our urban planning, but also in our conceptions of urban life, but how that is changing a lot where they're really um, this inner, you could almost say mashing up rural and urban, and that this um, where they exist isn't so easy to delineate anymore. And I actually think it's a good thing for our understanding of urban nature. 
So one of the things to think about the open field metaphor is that it's deeply rooted in the ideas of agrarianism and the cultural commons in the Midwest. And when we think about the Midwest, we think a lot about the family farm. Um, this is out in, um, in the Minnesota River Valley. But also the kind of key landscape feature there is the family farm and the farmstead. And so you could see here the field is a very dominant visual element surrounding this small family farm. But what you begin to see that in the urbanizing world is that we leave behind this idea of the open field, where the um, open field actually becomes a equivalent of a 401k for a farmer's retirement, and that we actually retire the open field to suburban lots. This is Gibbs Farm in St. Paul, where it's like a little boutique uh, uh, farm museum. That's how we get to know um, the open field or it may be um, a roadside curiosity. This is out in Scott County. Uh, you know, you can get your farm produce here on a, on a Sunday weekend, but this is maybe probably the one reminder people have of the open field experience in their weekly life. And um, probably the best open field people know in their suburban urban lives is their front lawn. It's neatly manu manicured. It also says something about us, is that in the open field that neatness matters especially when we drive by people's homes, that this neatness um, matters to be perceived of who is a good citizen and who is not. And uh, there was actually a good example on the news yesterday where uh, someone who lived in Minneapolis had their uh, ecological lawn, I guess it was too tall, it was greater than eight inches, it was mowed down by the city of Minneapolis. Um, so we can see that this idea is very powerful cultural saliency. And the important thing to realize is that our idea of open field goes into this public space too. Um, this is a field in the city of Chicago. It's where we play. So there's some very good um, ways that we shape our collective values of how we live as citizens through team sports. Um, also, we have um, the idea of open spaces in our parks. Here is, um, in Loring Park, a little bit less manicured area, but we have to realize that these aspects of the open field help with uh, mitigating urban heat island, provide social space for dense population living in center cities, and also create a variety of habitats for nature appreciation and education. But these are the kinds of models we've lived with for decades in the open field. It's either park or your lawn, or it's a farm outside of the city. But this really is starting to change. It's also this gentle balance, or maybe not so gentle balance, between um, <laughs> managing open spaces as cultural commons requiring careful interpretation of how individual independence and self-expression intersects with preservation of public values and benefits. This, this is a real place. It's in Scott County. It's actually at a site that was a controversial subdivision in a trout stream that feeds into the Minnesota River. I thought the developer had a funny sense of humor. I don't know if it was related to this development, but it certainly marked uh, the whole discussion about development in suburbia. And the important thing to realize is that um, this issue, the commons, and what happens is um, based on the signs we display. I love going to the city of Chicago and their parks because they love to put up these signs that are very much like tell you what you can and cannot do. Like, well, you know you're not supposed to dump in this park. Uh, this one says uh, no, no open containers of any type. This is a safe park. It's really saying what should or should not go in, in this commons. Here's another one. Uh, don't feed the animals, um, and because it attracts uh, very undesirable species. And so it's important to realize is that nature can be marginalized in these instances. But as we know with the whole, uh, uh, I guess you could say, trend in urban chickens and bees and all these different things that our notion of what animals belong in the city and what don't is changing again. And it comes back to how we frame our public values about the open field that often extend back to our, our private space of our lawns. And it's important to realize is that um, our ideas about the cultural commons are changing. And that um, this is a sign in a um, community garden in Chicago called the Water School. It's actually behind the community bulletin board, I think. But they, they have all these fun little handmade signs. And I think this is one idea is to say that we do need more wisdom about our relationship to urban nature. And here's another more official looking sign within the sh Chicago City Parks of that is saying that maybe nature can occur, but also to make sure that the crews don't mow down their, their, their restorations. And it, it makes us think about this connection 
to our legacy of the open field, the prairie ecosystems and the human cultures who've lived here long, long before ours and who are still here trying to reclaim their heritage. And one is that you can see extensions of this influence in our own restorations, like this coastal dune restoration at Montrose Point um, off uh, Lake Michigan in the city of Chicago. Um, you can also see this in a remnant um, blackland prairie that's been restored recently on the edges of Chicago, um, on the, uh, near an edge city. You can also see it in the uh, open field or meadow at the fields of St. Croix. You know, we really do like meadows, and they are such a dominant element when you begin looking. Uh, and they're right in front of us, but I think they're right under our noses and we haven't noticed them. We also can see it at the Prairie and Savannah Restoration at the Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary just east of downtown St. Paul. And what you begin seeing is that these alternative types of commons are actually um, places that people are wanting to seek out for a broader range of human nature experiences. Of course, people want to play sports in the park or um, enjoy a stroll, but it's also saying we want to experience other species and whether they're plants or animals, to broaden our understanding. And this is especially in, true in places where people usually think there's no nature, like in center cities. Um, we're also beginning to realize urban nature can mean understanding about where our food comes from. This is the city farm in Chicago. Um, it's just north of the Gold Coast, north of downtown. And I just love this juxtaposition of new urban development with some of their well-known skyscrapers because it begins asking a lot of questions about um, where our food comes from. And it raises questions like, does agrarianism have to be isolated at the urban edge? Or can agrarianism be inter inter intermingled into deep into the center city? New interpretations of the cultural commons are providing answers. This is another view of City Farm. I liked it because it was butting up right against this uh, new uh, uh, contemporary looking um, building. And so it begins asking questions. So are we going retro rural? Um, here is um, typically where we think of more agrarian type place, it's appropriate place in, in the commons, it's at the edge, like at a conservation subdivision. But then you get examples like this of the community peace garden in, in the Seward neighborhood of Minneapolis. Rural is popping up in places deep in the center city, and the question is why? Why do people want this? Um, is it urban nature? Is it biocultural diversity? It's also popping up in our cafes and where we eat and how we think about things. Um, it's a different aesthetic, but it's, it's a whole interesting way of thinking of things. It's calling back, this is the, um, to the Dowling Garden, to the Victory Garden tradition, and saying what role do these small places have in our understanding of ourselves, but also of nature. And it gets back to a central point in the commons, is that the, only, the um, open field only works if we each individually understand that these spaces work best based on some sort of self-restraint and moderation from overuse and allowing nature in these spaces and places to rest and renew. This is a slide of, in, of a pipe uh, draining water into the Minnesota River Valley. Um, there's many pipes into the Minnesota River Valley and the refuge there, but it gets you to think about our own individual contributions and us to think more holistically about our human nature interactions, but also um, the role that each of, each of us plays in life and allow, it, that allows personal space and renewal of, of the cultural commons for future generations and other non-human species. This is a view um, I, of, I took of a, it's a small architectural pavilion at a museum, whoops, at a museum. Um, in Germany called Instel Hombrosch. Um, it's in the Ruhr River Valley. But it's very beautiful because I like it's a view from inside a building looking at a kind of a cultured nature, but also with a backdrop of, I guess you could say, a wilder aesthetic in this juxtaposition. And I think it's a very apt metaphor for how we're supposed to think about our human nature interactions. Is it really a cut and dry of rural and urban are in particular places, or is it better for us as a species and other species for these things to intermingle? Because ultimately, we're looking for our own personal growth, but also growth of nature. And to think about how um, we can rejuvenate and also think about our creativity in creating new forms of urban commons. So thank you very much, and um, we'll move on to the next speaker.
Alrighty. Uh, here we go. Yes. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Sumath Gopinath. Um, I teach in the School of Music at the University of Minnesota. And um, this next talk, which is called Digital Information, the Commons and Property Right, a Warning, is a, a sort of is a project that comes out of or is sort of a, a meditation or reflection on a book that I'm writing on the global cell phone ringtone industry. And so it, uh, it sort of takes the other half of the commons, the less pleasant half of its history, which is about the enclosure, and really tries to sort of at least start thinking about that sort of thing. The, um, the images that I'll, I'll sort of show while I'm talking are semi-coordinated with what I'm talking about. They're not entirely, um, but they tend to draw from some of the things I've been thinking about vis-a-vis -vis ringtones and digital music. So uh, you may catch some of the references in there while I'm giving this uh, little uh, talk here. All right. Within the context of a self-avowedly liberal society, it is easy to take the fact of ownership rights for granted. Aren't the Lockean natural rights of life, liberty, and property, mystified in the US context as the pursuit of happiness thanks to Jefferson, the essential tenets of such a political order as conservatives love to point out? And yet, the extensive social impact of an access-based model with respect to the use of digital information has progressively crept into the mundane habits of billions of internet and communications network users all over the world, including the over 230 million internet users in the United States alone, as of 2008 according to the World Bank, and over 4 billion mobile phone subscribers globally. The most collective aspects of this practice, increasingly apparent over the last two decades, it would seem to signify a radical possibility of a new digital commons, or even John Barlow's dot communism, through a decline in ownership practices as a result of the reproducibility of digital information. Although visions of a digital commons based on an increasing collectivization of data usage are attractive to Marxists like myself, it seems that reality and ideal are confused all too frequently. Hence, in this talk, in contrast to the generally optimistic t tone taken in discourse on the digital, I'd like to ring out a modest warning about the digital commons and to advocate, perhaps paradoxically, for individualized forms of property possession. The notion of the commons isn't frequently associated with that of individual property ownership, precisely because the two stem from entirely different conceptions of ownership, one being at heart individual and the other collective. And yet, both arguably depend on the privileged presence of what Marx famously called use value over the role of exchange value. In the case of individual ownership, outside the, uh, of the workplace, by and large, the scene of the marketplace is merely one brief moment in the life of a commodity that is typically used to produce, reproduce the labor power of the worker consumer. Though, of course, the principle of ownership leads to the possibility, in theory, of the creation, circulation, and accumulation of capital, particularly in the case of small business owners or individual proprietors. The most significant capital transactions in contrast, especially today, take primarily place not as a result of individual ownership, but of the collective ownership of stockholding. Likewise, a commons, by its very definition, is a commonly owned, or better, unowned, resource that is accessed collectively and openly. Its very basis exists in its utility, its usefulness, and the availability of that utility. As Marx put it, the usefulness of a thing makes its u a use value but this usefulness does not dangle in mid-air." This is even true of information, that precious and highly mutable entity that serves in digital form as a primary class of commodities within the global economy today. For while information itself would seem to dangle in mid-air, particularly when conveyed by the telecommunications network, its use value is only real, realized in use or consumption, in Marx's words, which is to say that its material effects as image, sound, executable, executable code, etc., are plainly evident, such as when you play back a downloaded music file or a ringtone. That mater the material effects of information are, of course, highly, uh, highly uh, valuable. For if it is the case that use values generate exchange values, the magnitude of that utility, judging from trade figures, is astonishing. Already in 2007, global trade in information and communication technology, ICT goods, that's total exports and imports, was worth $3.7 trillion US, according to the OECD, which doesn't even account for domestic consumption of such goods. The magnitude of this value is inseparable from the progressive expansion of capital accumulation across the globe and from the fact that this expansion has been made possible by the pervasiveness of information commodities. Emmanuel Wallerstein's dictum that 
quote, the historical development of capitalism has involved the thrust towards the commodification of everything, unquote, rings true here, with the added possibility that the leading edge status of ICTs suggest a more limited corollary in the tendency towards the informatization of everything. And yet, the condition of information as a commodity poses a unique problem for the exchange process in that digital information is very easily reproducible, with the marginal cost of reproduction tending to almost nothing, limited only by computation time and energy expenditure in distribution. What does this practice uh, in what does what this does in practice is to create the possibility of digital information serving as what Eleanor Ostrom calls a highly non-subtractive form of commons, rather different from the traditionally subtractive forms of commons like water, land, forests, fisheries, etc., whose use can quickly lead to their depletion. However, the same fact also makes productive capital accumulation, based on the production process, far less profitable than the rent derived from privileged access to the information resource especially when that access is made use of, in, as in the case of a monopoly. The danger for information capitalism is that without controlling the scarcity of this information, very little in terms of either monopoly rent or productive capital accumulation can be guaranteed without introducing forms of access control over that information. For free software advocates of the world like Richard Stallman, this is a powerful aspect of information, one that can be used to produce a more egalitarian world. For content-owning firms, such as the big media conglomerates, this feature of information is to be battled at all costs, lest free exchange and piracy run them out of business, or so they claim. The story here is well known to you as consumers and news readers. It is one of MP3 and YouTube video sharing lawsuits, of digital rights management, DRM protection schemes, of walled gardens through limited access, internet access via mobile telephones. A story in which time and time again, intellectual property right control was visited upon the digital information commodity. The conflict explains why it can be such a pain to extract video from DVDs, why in 2009 you couldn't burn more than seven copies of the same iTunes playlist if it included an AAC file purchased in, uh, via iTunes, and why for a long time people paid 200 to $300 extra for ringtones representing under 20% of the same sound file from which they were derived. For precisely the same reason, it is why hackers and consumers have largely devised ways of working around these DRM schemes and limited access portals, leading to their failure in many cases, spectacularly so in MP3 sales. The impasse depicted here, coming to a head in the mid-2000s, has led to a kind of third-way solution, one that squares the circle of free culture and monopoly rent through access-based services, in which content is no longer owned by users, but merely leased or streamed to them, which amounts to a variation of the rent that I mentioned earlier. Although one could, might call this a commons of content, and some have, it seems to not to function exactly in this way, the proverbial devil being in the details. A media conglomerate solution to content delivery has long been in the works and has existed under a number of different guises. In the late 1980s, Vincent Mosco described it as a pay-per society, evocative of content delivery schemes like pay-per-view or pay-per-minute telephone use, and he used the notion to make an early attempt at theorizing neoliberal capitalism and its negative impact on state regulation of public services. By the mid-1990s, a new term within the media industry began to take hold, the celestial jukebox, articulated by Paul Goldstein in 1994 and transformed into a corporate catchphrase by the early 2000s. As Patrick Burkhardt and Tom McCourt describe it, the celestial jukebox is, quote, a toll booth into the web, into a web of privately owned and operated networks where traffic and intellectual property is carefully monitored and controlled, a walled garden of closed networks with restricted access and tightly circumscribed activities. The key to this model is subscription instead of sales, and streaming instead of downloading, though the difference is something of a fiction. In the case of digital music, it is worth noting that although DRM has been removed from almost all, comp all compact discs and most digital audio sales, including iTunes, subscription services like those of Rhapsody, Kazaa, and others still include DRM as part of all-you-can-eat streaming access models, uh, uh, effectively prevent you from archiving your music. In a rather different example, library subscriptions to academic journals have likewise prevented libraries from archiving journals leading to potential problems of access, particularly when servers are down or if libraries stop paying subscription fees. In these cases, I would argue that the most important issue here isn't the success or failure of such services. Much more crucial is that a new set of media habits is being formed, habits that favor instant access and the perception of permanence, thereby eliminating perceived needs for ownership of digital files. 
The most recent reincarnation of this kind of conceptualization would appear to be the so-called cloud computing model. Cloud computing, conceptually dating back to the 1960s, but only recently gaining traction as a business model, essentially imagines all major computing services to take place off-site via the internet or the cloud instead of what is happening on your own computer. Oh, whoops, let's get that there. The information access concept of the celestial jukebox is retained, and essentially all computing information and software are to be located in the cloud. As media evangelist Peter Finger writes in his book, Dot Cloud, the motto of the new perfectly globalized and collaborative business system will be, quote, one shared world, one shared computer, one shared information base, end quote. The rhetoric around cloud computing is eerily reminiscent of discourse on the digital commons. To quote a book serving as the mouthpiece of Google, one of the major advocates of cloud computing, quote, the cloud is a controversial buzzword that still frightens some companies, especially large operations that want, need, or think they need full control over their data. They worry that if the provider company goes belly up, their data may disappear along with the provider. There could be hackers, and what if the system goes down at a critical time for their business? They wonder if their intellectual property or proprietary information is safe online. The critique of fears of hackers, control, and implicitly trust places firms like Google in a vanguardist position, leading capitalism into a post-recessionary future. However, the issue of user habits is still crucial here. Web-based email programs like Gmail, online photo album services like Flickr or Google's Picasa, and other sites are examples of cloud computing in practice to which users have already been habituated. Such file storage and management systems are far less dependent on single computer terminals owned and used by single individuals, but through user accounts still track user information to customize advertising. More disturbingly, data uploaded to the cloud is typically not subject to the Fourth Amendment's search and seizure protections. Indeed, in compiling an unprecedented degree of user data and by working directly with surveillance technology firms and on-site federal intelligence officials, Google itself would appear to be at the epicenter of a massive transformation of corporate and state security surveillance, and the consequences of which are both profound and difficult to foresee. Companies like Google therefore seem to offer the image of a pseudo-commons to internet users in the digital world. That image recalls Nick Dyer Witherford's claim that the, in light of the structural failures of ne neoliberal policies, capital could, quote, turn to a plan B in which limited versions of commons, pollution trading schemes, community development and open source and file sharing practices are introduced as subordinate aspects of a capitalist economy where voluntary cooperation subsidizes profit. One can think here of how Web 2.0 reappropriates many of the innovations of radical digital activists and converts them into a source of rent. Unquote, unquote. Indeed, with the rise of trademarked, the trademark digital commons hosting platform system, which is licensed by the Berkeley Electronic Press and used by universities and other institutions for publication archiving purposes, as well as the proliferation of the university-based digital and media commons, which are typically limited to fee-paying and or employee university community members, uh, the very concept of the digital commons appears to be one of those reappropriations. But if, as, uh, as part of what James Boyle describes as the second enclosure movement, this very rhetorical move signals the temporary defeats of the alter globalization and radical hacker movements that claimed the language of the commons, perhaps the advocacy for ownership, or at least for a form of unalienable absolute possession of digital wares would provide a strategic ballast against the proprietary control of large swaths of information by apparently benevolent corporations and institutions. Thus, while still dangling in midair, the information commodities consumption might thereby be placed more solidly on common ground. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Caroline, and I'm just gonna start by showing you a video. It should. This is a project that I did with a bunch of people earlier this year. Should start here. Okay. So trade school was 35 days of classes and every night we'd have one or two classes on anything ranging from grant writing to crochet to singing in rounds and the class would be paid for with barter items so the teacher just 
says whatever they want in exchange for their class from students. It could be anything from a letter to a stranger to local vegetables. And it's been 35 days straight, so <laughs> now it's over. There were also classes on how to compost, demystifying caviar, and portraiture. For 35 days, over 800 people crammed into a narrow storefront on the Lower East Side to take those classes. It was a temporary space, basically a glorified hallway. Inside, people traded skills and knowledge, but money never changed hands. I think, you know, barter-based education is awesome. I'd love for there to be more of it. All right. I really appreciate the idea that we can share each other's skills. It seems like a lot of people come and they bring their ideas and then you get to take from it. And not everything is about, you know, paying for stuff. If you got something to offer and someone else has something to offer, it's easier to just trade it. I think it's really, you know, diverse. You know, everybody gets to talk and even the teachers learn something. Yeah, it would definitely come again. I think it's something that should be done more often. You invest your ta time and talent and you get theirs. I would definitely come again. I'm here tonight for the composting class and actually several of the classes that I wanted to come to were all booked. So I'd definitely be interested in coming back in. I think bartering in exchange for ideas is uh, a really interesting idea to explore. The idea of trade school and everyone coming together and working for a common goal, you know, to bring ourselves individually to another level is what learning and education is all about. So now we're going to do another experiment. Uh, a bunch of you have laser pointers, so if you could just dim the lights. If you have a laser pointer, could you draw a circle on the screen? Okay, so I've never done this before, but I'm really excited about the potential for us to model the internet without the internet and to visualize <laughs> the kind of energy we all have. Uh, so we're not online, but we're all on the screen. And now, could you guys draw a circle together? One circle. Let's try. You can do it. You can do it. Choose your point. Choose your point. Maybe if you stand still, you could all make a circle. Just try, try and just choose one point and go next to each other. I know, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Stand your ground. Just move over a little. Keep, guys, you can do it. OK, maybe, maybe one big circle. Yeah, 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 yeah. OK, it's a good beginning. I think that you guys, it's a good beginning. Give yourselves a round of applause. smiley face this was gonna be step two you guys are there wow this is great you almost made the step two smiley face wow okay well I think that this will be a class at trade school if we do it again okay now I'll go to the slideshow feel free to keep drawing you can draw while I show slides Yeah, I'll just, um, while he's loading that, I'll just say, I think um, hearing everyone speak so far, I think it's been amazing to hear all of this, but the question that comes to me is what can I do? So um, I've started, uh, I need to refresh this actually. Um, I'm part of a group that started a website for artists to barter with each other. Just refresh. Yeah, it's gone. Okay, there we go. Oh, oh no. 
<laughs> it's okay. It's the internet. You can just tap. Yeah. And then tap forward, I bet. Oh, maybe I'll type it in. Okay. Okay. There. Oh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So here we are. Um, I'm Caroline Woolard, and I'm a co-founder of the website. It's called Our Goods. And um, thanks for being here. It's really great to come. I've never been here before, and um, I'm really lucky. So thanks so much. Um, the website is called Our Goods. It's a barter network for creative people. So it's a tool that facilitates the barter of spaces, skills, objects, all kinds of things. And the real question is, what is our work worth to each other? I think as creative people, we often exist in a different kind of economy. And it's important to realize that there is a space where anyone involved in a creative project can get involved in someone else's project. Some people would say that the arts have always existed in a re recession economy, or at least an alternative one. And we know how to leverage things like enthusiasm and the support of our friends to make great things happen without money. So our goods is trying to facilitate more connections, to expand the scope of people that we can become available to, to make projects happen. It asks us to leverage our strengths. So, here. So again, on our goods, you can trade art objects, your skills, your space, all the things that you have to offer, and you can expand the network of people that you become available to. So Our Goods provides accountability tools, and it acts as a barter matchmaker. There's enough people on the site so that the coincidence of wants, that I have what you need and you need what I have, is actually possible. So we're using the web just to facilitate that connection. And we're considering making a point system so that if I give you my time now and work for you, I can bank the ability to get your time later. So hopefully we'll work that out. And what's exciting to us is that our goods creates new opportunities to value creative work. It's an opportunity for collaboration, and it's an opportunity to create an interdependent creative network across disciplines so that musicians and poets and furniture designers can all work together. Our hope is that if it expands nationally, we can have intercity exchange and touring across cities. So what does the site actually look like? We came up with an example user, we can call him Harvey, and he's someone who just wants to get his work done. So he goes onto the site and he makes his profile. You have to put all of your projects um, with your needs embedded in them so that everything is contextual. So he's doing a performance and he needs help building a set, someone with promotional expertise, a vocal coach, and a soundboard op. So he goes and he searches. He's thinking, first I need to find my vocal coach. That's the biggest problem for me. So he searches and he finds 19 people and he can look at their past history of bartering and he decides that he wants to ask Bridget to trade. So the site knows already what he has to offer her that's a good match and he proposes that, and then they begin trading. So this is what the, his background trade history looks like so he can keep track of what he's doing. And 
that's one way to use our goods, but what's important to us is that it isn't just about transactions. Our goods is also about building relationships. It's about the kind of mutual respect that is possible when you have to really engage with people and come up with a subjective equivalence of value. So another example user would be Cassie. Say there's someone who just wants to explore the site. They want to see what kinds of things are happening right now because suddenly everyone's listing what they're working on and you can see what's happening right now. So she's an explorer. She just goes to see what trends are emerging. If she's a curator, she might make a show around that. And so that's one way. Another example would be Anna, someone who's interested in the community that's online and she might be someone who sees that there's a skill that keeps being requested but isn't available. And she might start developing that skill in relationship to the community, community to make it possible. But most likely everyone will wear all of these hats at different points depending on what project they're doing and what they need. What's good about our goods is that you can approach it in all of those ways. So, why is it going to succeed? We're really excited to be working with Carl Tashin, and he's the senior site engineer from Zipcar. So he spent the first five years with Zipcar developing the code and answering phone calls in bed to explain to people how to share resources. So he's committed to make our good Zipcar for the cultural commons. And we also have Jen Abrams who works in a barter-based system for her theater production in New York. She's been working with WOW Theater for 10 years and knows all the nitty-gritty of bartering and really on the ground how it works. And also, I've been bartering this dress that I'm wearing that I designed with people just to see what kinds of things happen right now when I make myself available. So I've gotten everything from my personal website to unlimited laundry access to uh, lifestyle coaching. Um, and we also have Louise Ma and Rich Watts. That's the full five now. And they're doing everything from the user architecture, the way the site looks, to the printed material, and also the furniture in trade school. So they're doing all this on a volunteer basis, which is incredible. So for us, our goods is a way to think about the cultural commons because all of a sudden you can see yourself in relationship to everyone else across disciplines. So people suddenly get to know what's going on in all of the studios that they don't have access to or all of the recording booths that they can't really get inside. And trade school is a way to connect it to real time and space so that if someone has a skill they can make it available to other members of the community. and hopefully we'll be doing trade school again in the fall. So this is a way to model this kind of interdependent place of mutual respect where we build our skills together and really understand this kind of creative ecology of process so that you can get involved in the way other people are making work. <laughs> yes. And like I was saying before, you put all of the things you need within a project so that it's not just Craigslist where you get rid of manufactured goods that you don't want. It's about what you personally are invested in making right now and I understand why you want what you want. So you can actually start to think about people's rationale for being creative. And again, there's the potential for this kind of long-term connection. We'll see, we're in the alpha test right now, so we'll see where the next hub will be. We're in New York, but we could easily expand to other cities. We're just in New York because that's where we live and that's where local barters can take place. And like was mentioned before, the most important thing is trust. We've spent a long time developing a system so that people can track their deadlines and that accountability becomes visible to other users. So you have to leave a rating after you complete the barter and it's visible so that people are actually reliable or if they're not, everyone knows. So this, we really are serious about barter becoming a new paradigm. <laughs> yes. 
um, we think that resource sharing is the paradigm shift for the 21st century and that more and more creative people across disciplines should trade and become available to one another. We're in alpha right now, but if there's enough interest here, this could be the second site. And you should go on, check it out. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Apolito, and I'm batting cleanup, which is tough because suddenly all of you have laser pointers that I didn't expect. <laughs> Don't shine them in my eyes all at once. I know individually they're innocuous, but if all 20 of them shine in one retina, I may go blind. Uh, but there's beer at the end of my presentation. That's the good news. Let's see what I can find here. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Uh, but mostly about the idea of, of uh, commons as something that is compromised. I think I have a lapel mic so I can like, run around and people can still hear me. Yeah, great. Um, at least the, the idea that there's the commons is, is easily uh, compromised. And we accept the idea, for example, of a university or a, a hospital calling its dining hall full of Zbarros and McDonald's a commons. That's about as compromised, in my opinion, as you can get. Uh, but in a historical sense, of course, that's... Uh, this idea of uh, you know, sheep and animals can graze. Uh, in a European context, the commons was also a compromise. Uh, the original uh, free culture, uh, free access to land practiced by indigenous peoples was of course taken away over time by medieval and, and uh, uh, fiefdoms and kings. And it's only with the now mostly forgotten forest charter provisions of the Magna Carta that the king essentially agreed to return some of those rights to peasants to go and gather firewood and make use of the land. So that is also a compromise. That's already a, um, a, a step back from what there was originally uh, before that kind of ownership. Uh, well, OK, so if we're talking about compromise, then maybe the question is not whether a museum should emulate a commons or be a commons, but what kind of commons it should be, where does the compromise go, and what kind of compromises could uh, endanger us as, as, a, as a public heritage institution. And I'm going to basically look at a couple models that I think are highly compromised, namely the idea of a market-based commons and the idea of a zoo-based commons. And I'm going to talk about one which I think is more in spirit with the original uh, uh, values and freedoms that were enjoyed before that compromise existed. So starting with the idea of a market and a zoo. You know, museums like to think of themselves as above commerce, but all you have to do is walk into a gallery, uh, specifically at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, to see how many gift shops are, are located here and there. Um, you know, uh, this idea of a gift shop, I, I never understood those two words put together, gift and shop. Uh, they, they are a great way of kind of pointing out that kind of disparity between the idea of, well, here's a museum which is open to sharing and people coming in and, and experiencing that culture, and there is a shop where you buy things and take them home and throw them away eventually or give them to relatives who don't want them. When you think about the commons, though, uh, the original commons was all about stuff like firewood and acorns and grazing space and game that you could take freely. Very few museums will allow you to walk in, pick up their permanent collection, and walk out the door. Usually they charge you even to get in the door. And of course, even wonderfully free museums like the Smithsonian still have their gift shops as a reminder of that kind of market basis underneath some of the, uh, the museum culture. Well, if the way that museums control access to culture reminds us of a market, uh, the way that they attract visitors sort of, to me, resembles a zoo. And, um, I, I'm reminded here of the kind of way that the words curator and keeper are interchangeable. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, this explains why a zoo has uh, positions like the curator of large reptiles. And I once received a letter as a curator at the Guggenheim addressed to the keeper of modern art. <laughs> the ideal zoo, of course, the animals don't realize that they are the subjects of other people's uh, economic attention 
or perhaps laser pointing. Uh, <laughs> similarly, museums claim their value derives in the treasures in their vitrines, but everybody knows that if people didn't pay money to walk in and see those treasures, the museums wouldn't be able to pay the bills. When a market or a zoo masquerades as a commons, which can happen with social networks too, it's not just a brick and mortar thing, I think that the word degenerates into a marketing term rather than a radical shift in access. And that's particularly true if you think about the kinds of transactions that take place and how they're conditioned by what model of a commons you're working from. So I might sound glib by comparison, you know, comparing a museum to a market or a zoo, but if you really want to treat the commons as something dynamic, you've got to think about well, what, is it, what are we doing there? What kinds of, of transactions take place, both social and economic transactions? Transactions in a market, of course, are usually based on the accumulation of capital. And uh, that's sort of true in a zoo, except in a zoo, those transactions are invisible, right? The animals don't know about the guests that are paying money to see them. The zoo that is Facebook depends on its users being blithely ignorant of the fact that their most private information is being sold to other interests uh, without their necessarily being cognizant of that. Each of these ex economic transactions also have sort of social expectations that go along with them. So uh, it's well known that capitalist markets often lead to disparity in wealth that creates hierarchies, haves and have nots. In the world of zoos, the, ha the distinction between haves and have nots is so dramatic that uh, the animals don't even know the masters. They can't even vie with them because they can't even see them. Uh, the zoo is more like a way of domesticating its denizens. Uh, rather than simply creating a ladder of, of importance. And that means, what do we mean by domesticating? It means that you, we are essentially, uh, we're encouraging certain bonds that are useful for us, useful for the masters, and kind of outlawing all the rest of them. So we might take a tiger and we might give it some fresh meat to chew, or we might uh, let it a male tiger into a female uh, tiger's pen because we want to reproduce and have more tigers we probably wouldn't let it go drink water next to the wildebeest or go chew on some antelopes in the antelope paddock, right? Those are unacceptable sort of behaviors for us. And yet, a tiger that doesn't hunt, in what sense is that really a tiger? And if we're museums who gather culture that's in a very different sort of milieu or stuck under glass or in some other way changed from the dynamic in which it was created, is it still culture in that way? Is it still artwork? Is it still astronomy? Is it still uh, you know, artifacts from, from native civilizations? Similarly, Facebook encourages uh, its users to post uh, all kinds of stuff on their pages, you know, perhaps the mating rituals uh, of their private lives, but will sue anyone who tries to use that information on their own terms. In other words, Facebook's very specific about how they want it uh, uh, what those protocols are. Okay, well, one, two last things, sort of preservation and governance. Those are other, other two kind of aspects of the commons. Um, most museums follow uh, a sort of containment model of the, like the zoos to preservation, right? So here's what I think of when I think of how a museum preserves culture. Put it in a box. Uh, relegate the items under their care to a safe keeping uh, safe for future visitors to observe, of course, but also safe for uh, future curators to profit from. That's a lot like a zoo. I mean, keeping a tiger in a cage, we can say, oh, you know, we are preserving its species from extinction. But we're also preserving the sort of zookeeper's business. And I think although Facebook doesn't have physical bars, its architecture has virtual ones. Uh, you can't scrape it, you can't syndicate it, you can't redistribute it in any way that's not allowed by Facebook. They're really controlling the way content gets out much more than, say, blogs, YouTube videos, or even newspaper websites. Uh, its technical and legal stickiness makes Facebook's users stay put in the box that is Facebook, uh, even to the ignorance of the green space uh, uh, around them. Well, okay, if the instrument of governance employed by zoos is the cage, the instrument employed by the market is the law. And copyright, as been mentioned earlier, is probably the most kind of infamous example of a law that enforces a market-based approach to sharing resources. At first blush, we might look at things like Creative Commons and say, well, here's our savior, right? Here, here's a legal approach that doesn't follow that kind of, you know, market-based, um, you know, kind of containment model that uh, actually allows people to share 
uh, their music, their art, with minimal strictures or non-commercial license terms and so forth. Unfortunately, though, what Creative Commons is, uh, uh, licenses convey are still rights. And we hear that word rights. It's a very suspicious term when I hear it applied in the context of the commons. And here's why. Rights are a form of market-based law that detaches the judgment of whether I should do this or not from the context. Rights, in that sense, have a universal uh, aspect. And co Creative Commons, the rights that they uh, offer are wonderful in that they free consumers from the, the constraints of um, copyright uh, and, and theoretically from a capitalist economy. Unfortunately, they also represent a lost opportunity. If I'd make an MP3 and post it on my website and release it under a Creative Commons license, other people can take it. Uh, they, depending on the license I choose, they may be able to sample it. They may be able to just listen it, to it on their you know, iPods and so forth. But I don't know who those people are. They have no responsibility of contacting me. They have no incentive for contacting me. In fact, in many ways, they have no way to contact me. So the structure of rights is one not of attachment, of social bonding, but of one of detachment, of disconnection. Right? That's the idea of a market. In a market, the consumer has rights, the vendor has rights, but there's no necessary social bond created between those two. Well, I'm going to propose, or uh, I'm going to look at as the last sort of model for the commons, a very different model. I think it's different, and I'm going to call it, for lack of a better word, the tribe. I think it's the closest in spirit to the original uh, kind of uh, uh, ideas behind the commons, either close, at least closer than the market or the zoo. You know, the capitalist kind of overt economics of the market produce hierarchies. The more invisible economics of the zoo domesticate the denizens. What does a tribe do? The tribe's transactions create kinship, exactly of the sort that I think that the Creative Commons licenses don't do such a good job of. So in uh, cultures uh, that uh, share feasts and songs in indigenous contexts uh, like potlatch, uh, are those Practices are designed to connect people, unlike that sort of detachable gift of, of Creative Commons licenses. When you receive a gift in that context, you are indebted. You are in debt. But unlike the kind of you know, toxic mortgage assets and so forth we talk about in the global economy, that kind of debt is not bad. It is a good debt. Furthermore, it's a kind of debt you can't possibly work your way out of because it's an interpersonal debt that each of us owes to each other in a tribe. How could I possibly ever repay my parents for bringing me up, my mother for you know, raising me and giving birth to me? That's a debt that can never be uh, uh, fulfilled and uh, as anthropologist James Leach argues, should not be. It's actually a positive value even though in our economic terms we consider it a negative. Now, okay, so what's an example in contemporary terms of a commons that follows that kind of kinship model? Well, it doesn't do it perfectly, but one example that I might bring up is the pool. This is a, uh, an online environment for sharing art, text, and code. Uh, it's currently in use by a handful of uh, universities across the country, uh, and it's a, it, it is based on uh, the idea that people can share a uh, creative process even if they're not face-to-face, -face, and they can create forms of kinship through that. And I'm not going to go into much detail except just to point out a couple of aspects, which are that um, a whole set of versions of a project are tracked by the pool. Uh, a whole bunch of people who are involved in the project are tracked by the pool, and they're, they're, what involvement they have and what versions they uh, you know, belong to. Uh, there's tons of reviews, and there's also something called relationships, which I think uh, is the best, perhaps, uh, uh, example I can think of of that kind of kinship. Uh, you might be able to see the words ancestors and descendants. Where are those laser pointers where you need them? Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, up at the top. Uh, that's a very explicit uh, kind of suggestion of kinship, but it's no longer kinship like uh, uh, physical or, or, or um, via family ties. but via influence, artistic influence. So this idea of the pipeline actually was created uh, in response to or influenced by three other projects, Event Locator, Campus Calendar. One of those local affairs too, in, in turn, uh, was itself influenced by Event Seeker. 
Um, so you see a sort of like, you know, grandparents and parents. You can also see the children of a project. The pipeline inspired yet another project called OJ Connection, which you can see here on the right. So it's sort of a family tree that starts to develop between projects. That kind of kinship to us is very uh, exciting. Um, another aspect that I think is really important of the commons is uh, governance. And uh, I admit that I tend to project my own predilections onto native culture, but here's a case where uh, native uh, people from around the world actually had a big impact on a commons-based project. Uh, Stillwater, uh, the, the lab that created the pool, also uh, held a series of conferences involving more than two dozen uh, nations, both uh, uh, native and um, so-called developed world, in which we created the cross-cultural partnership as one of the outcomes. The idea here is that um, it's not based on an abstract right, it's a concrete context that determines the legal document. It is both a legal and ethical framework for sharing a cross-cultural divide. So what do I mean? I mean like, what if you are a musician, an electronic, you know, kind of Hispanic musician, and you want to use native flute in one of your compositions? How do you do that respectfully? What if you're an artist, and you have an idea that requires an engineer, and you need someone from Bell Labs who's an engineer, how do you collaborate together in a way that takes into account those two cultures, which obviously are maybe geographically located, but an artist and an engineer tend to think very differently. How about if you're a Cambridge anthropologist and you want to write a book about the herbal medicines of Papua New Guinea? How do you confront that divide that in a way that makes that element of trust that many people today have spoken about as being so important. The cross-cultural partnership is meant to do that. It, it doesn't emulate the physical prop boundaries of a zoo. It doesn't emulate the legal rights of a market, but it's about protocols. Protocols looking back to the way indigenous people looked at protocols as a, a model for uh, sharing and treating with each other, both inside and outside of the tribe. Uh, I think protocols are essential to the function of a robust commons, whether they take the form of the pool software scripts or the cross-cultural uh, partnerships legal template. Okay, one last piece here. Um, if ownership and containment are uh, kind of the key paradigms uh, of the market and the zoo when it comes to preservation, I think a tribe preserves by crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing has two pieces. We always know about the one that's, well, well, I give it to a lot of people and they all do their job. Well, automatically you're, you're breaking the idea of ownership by doing that. But the other piece of crowdsourcing that people often forget is you have to disconnect those people, okay? And that, of course, breaks the idea of containment. So we're already far beyond the sort of market and zoo metaphor here. Uh, well, all right, what does that have to do with preservation? Well, when you preserve stuff, you give it away to other people hoping that they will keep it going. And while outsourcing our job as curators and archivists and conservators to a bunch of unreliable archivists sounds really scary, in fact, indigenous people have been doing this for millennia. And that accounts for why, for example, the oldest cultural memories are not embedded in stone tablets in the British Museum, but are actually embedded in the oral histories of, say, the Brazilian rainforest, where there are legends and stories and songs of beasts that are literally prehistoric, that literally died out uh, 10, 40, 50,000 years ago. That's an extraordinarily long memory, and it's made possible by this sort of crowdsourcing approach to unreliable archivists. Well, a similar approach to the sort of proliferative preservation can be found in the remix culture that some have alluded to today of digital artists. So the Berkeley Art Museum has an interesting project called the Open Museum, which explicitly says whenever we acquire something, we're gonna make the files open as the artist determines to remixing by other people. Very different model than the usual kind of containment idea of how museum collections work. Closer to home, just this week, the Walker Art Center was in fact the unwitting target of proliferative preservation. In 1998, then Walker curator Steve Dietz commissioned an online artwork from Janet Cohen, Keith Frank, and myself called The Unreliable Archivist. That was a prophetic uh, title, you'll see why. It took the irreverent approach to preserving this site called Adaweb, one of the sort of first and foremost uh, online art pro uh, projects, uh, which had been uh, archived that year by the Walker and is still accessible via the Gallery 9 website, uh, which you can see here. Uh, 
the unreliable archivist took this irreverent approach by reassembling that art, uh, images, texts, styles, languages, all these aspects of that site in an order that was not determined by the original creators, but by these sort of categories chosen by the, uh, by the users, uh, people who visited uh, the walker. Um, the most notorious aspect of the uh, unreliable archivist, however, was not how it worked, but how it failed. Because like a lot of that kind of early net art, um, it depended on this HTML tag that soon went moribund called the layer tag. And so after a few years, it stopped functioning. So the laughing joke was like, well, you know, it's so funny because it becomes, the unreliable archivist becomes an ironic symbol of the very obsolescence implied by its tag. Until now. Da, da, da. Now let's see if I can get down in here. Where are you? Unreliable Archivist 2. Whoa, that's weird. What's happened there? There we go. This is the Unreliable Archivist as recreated by its original artists. And the only reason we were able to recreate it, I'll just show you um, some aspects. You can play with, for example, the images, change their style. Each of these is drawn from a different uh, uh, aspect of, um, of, uh, of, of Adaweb, the original site. So the images are drawn from one project. The text might be drawn from another one. I can change the layout from another one. Uh, I can change the style from another one, just kind of add them, and it gets crazy after a while. Uh, you see, the walker never actually acquired the files necessary to run the work. And why? Well, totally a practical reason, which is as artists, we were always tinkering with it. And we were like, oh, don't worry, Steve, we'll get it done soon. We're, we're, we're still, we almost got it. Uh, give us a few minutes. And, uh, and, and of course, we never, that sort of few minutes turned into hours, turned into days, turned into months and a decade. And we still had, <laughs> we still had the files running on our server. Now, the walker had a frame set pointing to it, so you never knew that it was actually secretly uh, ran, run by the uh, artist. And I think we all forgot that that was the case. And then when it broke, we were all like, eh, well, it broke. Well, the fact that we still control the files now enables us to uh, uh, recreate the site as we did here, Frankensteining it back into working order, uh, totally rewriting it according to the current web protocols. And that kind of act of proliferative preservation in which the walker unwittingly gave control of its collection over to a bunch of crazy artists has now allowed that work to, to live again. So uh, I'm proud to announce for the very first time the Unreliable Archivist 2, or an up-to-date doppelganger of the original, and it's taken its place back in the Walker's online collection thanks to the tribal protocols of the internet. Thank you very much. Um. Okay, don't go yet. <laughs> We're gonna, we, this is a lot of ideas. I don't know if you guys are feeling this, but it's kind of like idea overload. We didn't know exactly what <laughs> everyone was gonna say and it's kind of, it's great because it, it was all over the place. Um, we're gonna invite all the speakers um, up back up here. Um, you do want, I thought someone was grabbing them some chairs. Yeah, so we're gonna invite them all back up here. And what we've asked them to do is to come up with a question that they would like to ask you. Um, and so we're going to do the Q&A, but it's going to be a, in reverse. And they're each going to ask a question, and we're hoping that some of you um, will have some answers. And so we'll have microphones um, on both the aisles, and we're going to try to get them to people um, in a timely fashion. And the reason is that we're recording um, this for live webcast, and so whatever's on the mics makes it on there, and whatever's not doesn't. Um, so why don't you guys all come up here and... Um, we don't have a set order for this, so if one of you is, is really pumped to start, um, go for it. <laughs> uh, maybe John, since you just got done, maybe you're in the, <laughs> you're like ready to go. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we'll do this. Okay, so. Uh, I guess that's on. I talked uh, a little bit about protocols and how important protocols were for my sense of the commons. I'm just curious if anybody in the audience has examples of a protocol that worked really well for a commons-like experience you had or one that really stank. <laughs> this is only going to take about protocols. 10 minutes. It's, it's soon. It's coming very soon. There's one question from each uh, presenter and we'll just kind of move down the line. 
Um, I was going to ask something about barter, but actually, I just want to see if you guys can make a circle. Can we? Can we do that? I just want to. I feel like you've gotten better. <laughs> Oh! See it? It needed somebody to lead the way to steward Perfect. this. Perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, how many of you watch TV on your computers as opposed to on a TV? All right. How many of you download music files? As opposed to listening on a CD. Wow. How many of you uh, download like uh, smartphone or iPhone app applications apps? Man. <laughs> All right. <laughs> who does it? <laughs> yeah, why? So why? Why not? If you don't. Why don't I? Yeah. Because I would rather have direct person-to-person -person interactions, and I gave up my TV 25 years ago. I use my computer for work, and I don't use it to interact. I like I like live. Do you make art or music yourself? I do. <laughs> Good for you. I do. A lot of times by myself, but I do make art. I guess I'm next for a question. I'm wondering how many of you saw the news item about the guy with the ecological lawn and it was mowed down? Did any of you watch that? It was on WCCO last night. Oh, yeah. What did you What did you guys think of that? Like his he he planted a certain grass. I don't know what type, but it was taller than eight inches. Do you think it should have been mowed down? <laughs> he he lived in Minneapolis, I think, in South Minneapolis. What what? So oh, Seward neighborhood, one of our <laughs> ecological neighborhoods, where that is considered an ecological lawn is or plantings, but there's not a lot of uh, kind of tall grass prairie lawns. It's small, like in the median strips. Any thoughts about that? Um, well, I heard that he he put about three years into it and possibly at least a thousand dollars, and that at a certain point it would take care of itself, but it hadn't yet reached the point where it takes care of itself. So I guess we're not willing to give people time to let things take care of themselves. Yeah, I think it's a city ordinance. Well, it's a good question. You know, if we think about lawns, and uh, if it's more than eight inches, if we think about the inspiration of, for a lot of our ecological design, it's kind of like prairies. And those are definitely taller than eight inches because we live in the tall grass prairie. Um, but the question is, should we miniaturize landscapes like that for our lawns? Is it even, have we gotten to a point where we're still kind of doing small little plantings, you know, of perennials with flowers? For example, if, if it had been planted more like flowers, would it have been mowed down? if it was more than eight inches? You know, it's, it's a good question. Just in, in response to that, I, it's a city ordinance. I have a friend that works at the city council and generally it, it depends on who your neighbors are and how they complain about you. There's a, a house near mine that has a lawn that's about five feet tall and nobody complains about it. So um, in response to your last comment, I, I think it's quite interesting that the rain gardens that are sponsored throughout the city have similar types of landscapes to the one in Seward that you're pointing out. And some of those rain gardens that have been um, funded around the city are almost exactly the same. So, But they have signs that say it's an official rain garden. 
It, and that was one of the things that was pointed out that um, if you want to have something like this in the future, he, that you should put up a sign that it's an ecological lawn. And it reminds me of a story that I read in a book. I forgot the book, but it was very interesting where um, a similar thing happened. Uh, an, I think it was an entomologist allowed his uh, lawn to become like a more native habitat, and people were starting to complain about it. And then he put up a sign that said it was uh, wildlife habitat, and, and the complaint stopped. And so it, it, it raises a lot of interesting questions, like the signs I had about um, the commons. Like, it, it's a form of social communication. And so it's, it's very interesting. Um, to raise, you know, if it was flowers and they were really tall, or a rain garden which does have tall grasses in it, um, it's it's a really good question whether peop everybody reads these landscapes the same way. I, I just I, I guess I want to hear a little quick story from anyone out there who's either been delighted at with a digital resource, a museum digital resource they've been able to find online, or conversely, if they've ever been frustrated or thwarted, thinking they should be able to get something digitally from a museum, but haven't been able to find it or get it. Way in the back. <laughs> no museum professionals, please. No, I'm a, I'm a middle school uh, librarian. And um, the Library of Congress site confused me with uh, some of its resources and how to find the resources within it for kids. Um, I didn't think it was very intuitive and, and allowed, me, allowed the kids access to find the stuff within it. And there's tremendous resources on there, like you know all the old videos from Thomas Edison and da da da. Um, one resource that I find very intuitive is iTunes U which is just like phenomenal searching. Um, that's the other end of it too, so. Yeah. That's great, that's great to hear, yeah. it's really useful Unfortunately, to Unfortunately, my school district doesn't allow iTunes U, it's, it's illegal, yeah. so. Uh. <laughs> well, I hear that a lot. That's really helpful, thank you. Was there one more person? Yeah, I, I just went to the, um, the, what's the Russian museum here? Is, okay, yeah. The Museum of Russian Art, and um, they had a exhibition of photographs, and by this guy who did photography around the turn of the century, and they did two versions of the exhibition. And in between exhibits, I went to the gift shop, and um, they had one of the prints from the first install. And I said, "Are you selling that?" And he said, "No, um, but you can go to the Library of Congress." and download the exact same high-res image. And I've been doing that. There are about <laughs> 2,000 of those, but um, yeah, that's... That's neat. That's a very cool story. Um, so I think it is time to wrap it up. I think folks have sat for a while, but I really thank you all for coming. Um, it was great to have all of you here as well. Um, I know those some of you came in from very far away. Um, I hope that this was a conversation starter and got your minds turning a little bit um, about open field and what could happen this summer. Um, we'll take it outside, and there's actually a DJ out there who's going to be playing some music. Um, maybe you feel like dancing now that you've <laughs> sat for a while. Um, so uh, come up to the to the presenters if you have questions for them um, that you didn't get a chance to ask. So we'll keep it going. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank